welcome everybody. Thank you for worshiping with us on this first Sunday in November. It's great to be together. Uh, hopefully you uh, set your clocks properly so you know what time it is. And if not, thanks for joining us anyway. Uh, and uh, come and join us as we worship the Lord, as we give glory to God on this first day in November. Let's praise Him together this morning. Jesus, we thank you. We love you. We praise you for who you are. Thank you for bringing us through the month of October and now through this new month that's on us, Lord, we thank you. Lord, as we look forward to uh, that day when we celebrate Thanksgiving, we thank you for this season that we're in. We thank you, O oh God, as we look forward to Advent as well and all that you have for us. We want to give you praise and glory for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Oh, 
to you. Lord, may your glory cover this earth like the waters cover the sea. May your glory cover our lives like the waters cover the sea. Lord, may your glory be exhibited throughout all of creation. For you are great and greatly to be praised. And we bring you glory today. Thank you for knowing us, for loving us, allowing us to know. 
know you, love you, and return. But thank you for this, Jesus. We ask your blessing on our time together now this morning. For your blessing in our lives, lead us on in you. And help us to experience you in a fresh and real way. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Well, good morning, and thank you for checking in with us today. Hope you enjoyed our time of worship together as we start this brand new month. It's the month of November uh, 2020, and so thank you for checking in with us, whether it's Sunday morning that you're joining us, right, when we're joining ourselves at church, or whether you're watching us sometime later. Thank you uh, for being part of, of our congregation this morning. As we jump into part three of my three-part series on the case for Christ's return, so I, I hope that you were able to watch the last two weeks. If not, please go back and uh, go back on YouTube or Facebook and see if you can find them. They're on our YouTube channel, very easy to find. And uh, watch parts one and two. Part one, we talked about the, the genealogy from uh, Adam to Noah in Genesis chapter five on how that presented the gospel message uh, right there at the beginning of the book of Genesis. Uh, and then last week we talked about the seven churches in Revelation and how those two, uh, those two listings can sort of uh, dovetail or actually flip on top of each other uh, and uh, give us an idea of the season that we're living in when we look towards the return of Christ. And so, again, we're not, we didn't set any dates for the Lord's return. That would be silly and unbiblical. Um, but we do look at the season we're living in, and the reality is the season of Christ's return is right now. We're in that season right now. And so uh, it can be any day now. Uh, of course, we know that. And again, I hope it was a blessing to you, parts one and two. And today we'll finish up with part three here of the case for Christ's return. As well, uh, many of these things I'll unpack in a more detailed way. Uh, uh, manner next year it's, I'll do some series on some of these as well so we'll be able to go back and visit them uh, because over the last two weeks I just really touched on the surface of, of that topic and so we'll work on that a little bit more in 2021 should the Lord Terry give me the opportunity to do that so uh, but thanks for joining us today and um, as we did in the last two weeks Revelation chapter 119 gives us the uh, outline for the book of Revelation where John is told by Christ to write, therefore, what you have seen, <clears throat> what is now, and what will take place later. And so um, we talked about the things from history in, in Genesis chapter 5. We talked about what was the present, which was the churches uh, in Revelation, as well as the things which were to come, what will take place later. The churches in Revelation pointed us to that as well. And today I'm going to sort of solidify that with some facts from the, from the New Testament and the Old as well, talking about this. So um, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, this is uh, sort of a cornerstone of New Testament theology. Uh, it's uplifting Jesus Christ. It's lifting up Christ and making him be praised. So we, look, we want Jesus Christ to be praised in our lives, uh, in our churches, in our homes. Uh, and starting with verse 5, it says this, in relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so verse 9, pay attention here now. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. 
So here we see the reason for the return of Christ that we look forward to is for Jesus Christ to be praised. The reality is that even as time is working through, as we look at some of the things happening in our world, and we see that the world is, is lining itself up to go against Jesus Christ, to go against the things of God, um, even churches, you know, denominations are lining up to sort of come against the Word of God, where they're putting the teaching of man on equal footing, if not equal footing, sometimes greater footing than the Word of God. Uh, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And we see this happening even in Christian circles. And so how much more in non-Christian circles do we see this happen? The governments of this world uh, are looking more and more towards an ungodly form of government. And uh, not standing for true righteousness, but standing for humanism, uh, which is the greatest you know, attack against the church that we see today, is the attack of humanism. And so... The idea is that Jesus Christ is going to be praised. That this is what God's desire is, is for his son, Jesus Christ, for God the Son, uh, to be praised to the glory of God the Father. So when we lift Jesus up, we lift up the Father. When we lift Jesus up, we lift up the Spirit. When we lift up the Spirit, we lift up the Father and the Son. When we lift up the Father, we lift up the Son and the Spirit. There's this, this triunity that they have that is beautiful as we uplift and lift up the name of Jesus um, it brings glory to God. And so uh, God is going to be glorified. In fact, he's going to be glorified through this world. Even through this world, even as the world waxes more wicked, God is going to be glorified. And he will have his way. Um, we have an election coming up here just in, in two days. And the reality is God is going to be glorified. No matter who wins in any office, God is going to be glorified. And God has a purpose and a plan that he's working out in our nation and uh, I believe God is not done with the United States yet. I believe there's still a work for us to do. And uh, as, as a church, there's definitely still a work for us to do while it's still dead. And so God is going to be glorified uh, through our lives, through everything that happens, even this week here in the United States. In Romans chapter 14, uh, Paul goes on as he writes to the church in, in the Romans, and he says this in verse 10. You then, why do you judge a brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Let me just say that. You know, uh, there's been a lot of consternation between Christians through this election season. You know, um, listen, you can disagree with somebody. In fact, uh, there are friends that I have that I disagree with politically entirely. And yet, uh, I have no right to judge them or to place, uh, you know, condemnation on them. Uh, and, and so Paul talks about this here. He says this, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And God knows we're going to all have enough to give an account of. All right? None of us are going to be innocent when we stand before Christ in that judgment seat um, because it's important how we treat each other. And we fall short in that so often. You know? And so we want to, we want to uh, make the focus be on, on, on if we're going to correct someone, let's correct ourselves first before we start correcting other brothers and sisters. Right? And so he goes on and says, It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, Every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So that each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. And so the reality is, listen, all of us are going to bow our knee to Christ. All of us are going to confess that Jesus is Lord, including those who don't follow him now. I mean, for us, it's going to be a joy at that day to be able to bow before Christ and declare that he's God. But think of some people. It might be the first time in their life they've done this. And of course, they're not going towards glory. They're going towards judgment at, at that time, when that judgment day for them comes. And so we want to we want to give glory to God now in our lives. We want to glorify him. That's what we talked about last week. We ended up uh, the, the, our time together last week with the question, are you ready? Are you ready to to see Christ? Are you ready to have your eyes closed in death? Are you ready for the trumpet to, to blow and the Lord to return? Are you ready for that? Are you living in anticipation of that? Because we are going to have to give an account of ourselves to God. And so we want to live in anticipation of that. So I'm going to go through again today, just touching on some of these things to sort of solidify what I've gone over the last two weeks, the idea that the gospel message is there throughout all the scriptures. And then even at the end of the book in Revelation, uh, to the seven churches in Asia Minor, the message is there about the Lord's return as well. And so uh, there's many other places as well that sort of focus on that in the scriptures. 
right? Um, and there are some other things that are happening around us that it seems like the signs of the times are exploding all around us. And so let me go through a number of these major signs of the times. And again, I will unpack these later in 2021 as we go through a series here. But I'd just, just like to touch the surface of them today. Um, in Matthew chapter 24, one of the, the great discourse that Jesus has about the end times, um, he talks about the sign of Israel, the restoration of the nation of Israel. And remember, Israel was destroyed as a nation. In AD 70, Jerusalem was conquered. By Titus the Great, he sacked Jerusalem, burned it, um, you know, destroyed the temple. And, uh, you know, for 1,900 years, roughly, uh, Israel did not exist as a country. And then it was restored in 1948. Um, and so in, in, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, it says this, Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. And the fig tree represents Israel. As soon as its twigs get tender and the leaves come out, you know that summer is near. See, it's knowing that season. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. It is the return of Christ. Verse 34, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So here, Christ gives the sign of the restoration of the nation of Israel. I mean, he's giving this, this, this discourse while Israel still existed. And he said, hey, listen, when the fig tree, when it begins to, to, to blossom, as it begins to have leaves come out once again, you know, it's, it's a new life. It's a new season now for the nation of Israel. When you see that, know that the things that I'm talking about right now in Matthew chapter 24, um, uh, these things are near. They're near. We're living in that season right now. So we know, uh, you know, as well, it, it talks about this, this reestablishment of Israel Way before this discourse, back in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 7 and 8, in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 11 and 12, it talks about Israel being restored, uh, you know, after a time of captivity, and then the truth is also, even after a period of, of, uh, of not existing, for 19 centuries. Um, and so we see that happen. We know that in 1948, the star of David flew over Israel, as Israel was established as a country. Uh, and in some of our lifetimes, and some people who are watching this broadcast, graphic, in our lifetime, we've seen this happen. And then for many others of us, I wasn't around in 1948, but in 1967, uh, in the 1967 war, Israel uh, in battled and it fought and it, it got the entire um, city of Jerusalem under its control. Uh, Jerusalem was, was unified under Jewish control by 1967. And so, the Israelis control all of Jerusalem. That's the first time uh, in, in millennia that that was the case. You know? And so even when Jesus was talking about this, Jerusalem wasn't controlled by the Jews. It was controlled by the Romans. And so, uh, but Israel has total control over Jerusalem today. In fact, our embassy was moved to Jerusalem uh, just this past year. And so uh, you know, we see that there's these things happening in Israel. And the sign of Israel is by many ways the greatest sign of these last days that we're living in. All right, and then we see that the Jewish people possess Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 21, verses 24 and 28, it says this, Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And in verse 28 says, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And wow, what a great promise that is for us. You know, listen, when we see these things happening, we don't lose heart. We gain heart, and we take heart in the fact that Christ is coming. Our redemption draws near. Uh, and so we, we, we know that, listen, we're living in the, in the final days of the last days. And so we take heart in knowing that. Why? Because we are part of the victorious team that Jesus leads. He is our captain, and we follow him in victory uh, that he's provided for us. Amen? Uh, another sign is the global spread of the gospel. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talked about this. And so the gospel has spread to all the continents, to all the nations of the world. Uh, you know, even nations that have been uh, historically atheist, the gospel has come into those places. In many nations where the gospel is, it's not just not promoted, but it's illegal, it's still spread. In the nation of Iran, uh, you know, this theocratic nation of, that's Islamic, uh, they cannot stop the spread of the gospel. They, they, they believe there may be over one million born-again Christians in the nation of Iran. 
And uh, let me tell you, it's not easy to be a Christian here, but it's spreading like wildfire. Why? Because Christ pr professed it to be. He declared it to be. He prophesied about this. And we know that this is a sign of the end times as well. We also see Israel surrounded by enemies. It talks about that in many places in the Old Testament. Psalm 83, verses 4 through 12, Ezekiel 11, 14 through 17, and 35, 10. Um, we see that uh, Israel will be surrounded by enemies. And if you look at from 1948 on, uh, Israel has had hostile enemies all around it in its entirety. Now, of course, uh, this past summer now, this past fall, uh, Israel is beginning to sign peace treaties with some of their neighbors. It's an incredible thing to see. Um, and you might say, well, isn't that, a, isn't that a sign of the coming of the Antichrist? All I know is, listen, Israel is established as a nation, and it, it's good for those nations around it to, uh, to come and to make peace with it, because Israel leads the way in that part of the world in so many things, not just in freedom, uh, but in medicine and in technology, uh, uh, in agriculture, and water purification in, in medicine. There's so many things that the, that the Jewish people in Israel are, are leading the way in, in the world. It's amazing. And so, uh, you know, uh, this is a good sign for these things. And remember, and, and I'll talk about something else in a minute here as well, uh, that Israel fields a mighty army. This is another sign. In Ezekiel chapter 37 and Zechariah 12, uh, Israel's army is a mighty army. Of course it is. It's formidable. Uh, no nation would dare just attack it because Israel's army is very strong. And it's not just strong because it has good military. And thank God for the connection between the United States and Israel. Uh, listen, uh, as we bless Israel, God blesses us. That's the promise given. And so I'm thankful that over the last few years, our country has been very pro-Israel, very strong on Israel. And uh, there would be those Christians who think we shouldn't be. Um, I don't know what Bible they're reading. I just don't understand that. Um, listen, the promise given to Abraham through Isaac and Jacob, through his people today, still is truthful. And so we see that God is blessing that nation, and as we bless them, um, uh, God blesses us. You know, and, and I hope we never come to a place where any of our leadership uh, stands in opposition to Israel. Uh, because we, you, know, you, you can just wait for that time where God will take his hand of blessing off the United States. Uh, with that. And then there's also the rise of a united Roman Empire. We see that even happening. Uh, in our world, in many ways, there's alliances being made. Uh, you know, you see what's happening in the Islamic world as that's rising together, where there is this uh, unification of some of those countries are coming together in them, as well as uh, in Europe, there's a coming together of those nations. And so, uh, you know, this is happening as well. Um, another thing is the, the rise of the Gog and Magog alliance. You see that happening now uh, between Iran and Turkey uh, and Syria. Uh, there's this alliance that's happening there. This is Islamic alliance. Of course, we saw that uh, a few years back when ISIS, when Daesh was in power, and they were trying to form a caliphate that would cover that whole area. And, um, and so there's these rising, this, this surging of the nations that's happening. We see that that was prophesied by God as a sign of Christ's return. All right? Um, and, and as well, uh, remember, not all Arab nations go into that that Gog and Magog alliance. In fact, in, you can read it in Ezekiel uh, 38 and 39, that Gog and Magog alliance, when they attack Israel, um, there, there are some Arab nations that come against them and say, what are you doing? And incredibly, you can go ahead and read it, uh, God destroys those countries that come against Israel. Um, and I believe, I mean, I don't want to get off on this, but I believe that that's going to take place after the rapture, and that will open up those 144,000 Jewish missionaries uh, talked about in the book of Revelation to go to those Arab nations and spread the gospel uh, because they're going to see Israel and they're going to see that God literally defends Israel against these armies that come against them and destroys them. And then that's going to open up for those missionaries to take the gospel to those Arab nations. And I believe, I believe with all my heart, that during the tribulation, there are going to be millions upon millions of Muslims who come to Christ during the tribulation period. Uh, and this is one of those things that I, I believe is going to happen. Uh, and it, the Bible talks about it right here as well. There's also an increased call for global government in Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. And, and you know, we see that even in the United States. There are those, and listen, I don't know how the election is going to go this week, but there are those who want us to become more in part of the globalist community, and there are those who want us to be, and really, that's really what the election comes down to, is 
Do we want to stay as the United States standing on its own, or do we want to be part of a global government? And, and um, you know, personally, I don't believe that that's what God has for our country, but there's calls for this. And we remember, the globalist push is going to come to its, its head in when the Antichrist comes into power and really oversees a vast majority of the world and rules it um, as, as he's inspired by Satan himself. And so I want no part of that. But the Bible calls, talks about that as well. We also see it as part of society degrading. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we know that Paul says, listen, in the last days, perilous times would come. Men would be lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God, lovers of their stomachs rather than, you know, and it goes through that whole laundry list. And we see that happening in society today to where, you know, what is right is now wrong and what is wrong is now promoted. Not just promoted, but in today in the United States, if you disagree, you're persecuted. You can totally disagree with things that are morally wrong and you are looked at as being scum of the earth because you don't agree with what society says is now good. You know, which was evil 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago, five years ago for that matter, is now looked at as being not just good, but the only thing you can believe. You can't even have a difference of opinion today in the United States in so many ways. Society is degrading all around us, right? Another sign is the widespread ridicule of Christ's second coming. I remember when I was in high school, I had a book in my locker, and there was a kid I was going to ride to school with, and he was going to walk home with me, and uh, he, he, he grabbed this book that I had, he opened it up, and the scriptures were there talking about Christ's return. And he read them right out loud, right there in the hallway. And I, I have to admit, I was, like, I was in 10th grade, I was a little embarrassed as he read that out right, right there. And he just he hands me the book back, and he goes, do you believe this? And I turned to him and I said, well, yeah. And that was it. He didn't say anything else. You know, but the reality is, listen, a lot of people scoff at the Lord's return. And let me say this. I've seen some of the greatest scoffing about the return of Christ from people in the church. I'm not talking about unsaved people. In fact, to a degree, unsaved people today can feel, they can sense that something is happening, that something big is coming down the road and it's not good. And Christians, so many Christians, are living like they have all of eternity to live on this earth. And so there's widespread ridicule about Christ's second coming many times from people in the church. And shame on us on that day when he returns. Man, I hope we go with him if we ridicule this coming. You know? Boy, will we, will we be shocked when that takes place. Um, but I'm thankful for his return for all these So all these signs come, and they point to the soon return of Christ. And again, I'll unpack these later on in 2021, uh, if the Lord gives me opportunities to do that. Um, they point at the return of Christ. He's right at the door. He told us to look up. Our redemption is drawing near. And they're converging all around us right now. There's so many of them happening all around the world. And I've only touched on the surface of, of just a couple of them this morning. Um, it means we're on the cusp of the end times, folks. We are here. We are ready uh, for that second coming of Christ. Christ coming. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. In Revelation chapter 4, let me finish this up here this morning with just a few passages of Scripture. In Revelation chapter 4, uh, the Apostle John, he's told in Revelation 1 to write down what was, what is, and what's to come. And then he goes through the, the seven churches of Revelation. We went through those last Sunday. And then he comes in chapter 4, and everything changes in chapter 4. There's a, a marked change. And what happens in chapter 4, it says this in verse 1, it says, after this, uh, so after what was, and after what is, now there's what is to come. And so in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it says this, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take, take place after this. And once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. Folks, listen, there's going to come a day when the door is going to open up in heaven for us. And there's going to be a voice that's going to say to us, Come up here. It's the same voice that's going to be the voice of the trumpet. Come up here. Come up now. Come into my presence, church. And the Lord is going to take us and he's going to bring us with him. Those that have gone and they're up in heaven right now in their spirit and they're living in paradise are going to be reunited with their earthly bodies that are remade. And we are, are as one, we're going to go up and be with Christ. And then he'll show us what's going to take place. Man, let me tell you, those seven years that we spend with Christ in heaven is going to be just that. It's going to be heavenly. 
those seven years here on earth, anything but heaven. But I'm thankful that the Lord is going to come and take us. Like he promised the Philadelphia church, I'm going to keep you from the hour of testing that's coming on the whole earth. I'm going to take you, and you're going to be with me. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our God, great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. See, this is our blessed hope. Folks, listen. There's so many great things to be able to have hope about in life. But this is our blessed hope. This idea that Christ is coming back, it's not just a pipe dream hope. It's a blessed hope. It's something that goes beyond anything else that you can, I mean, what, winning the lottery? You know, having a child, having a family, getting a new car, any of those things. You know, having a great a health report. Those are great things. But listen, having this blessed hope in our lives surpasses anything else that we have. Because we know that we have, this place is not our permanent eternal home. But there's something greater for us that God has. We're going to be able to be in the presence of Christ and all that that will offer us. It's not like we're going to be just, you know, sort of stick to Jesus for eternity. He gives us an opportunity to continue to live, live beyond what we can live even today in eternity. What a great hope we have as believers. How incredible is it? In 1 John chapter 3, we see this incredible love that God has given to us. It says this, see what great love. I love the King James says, behold what manner of love. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. I mean, get this. I mean, literally, when, when, that, when that trumpet calls and that door opens and the voice says, come up here, and we go to be with Christ, we will be like him. I mean, you could say, well, we can be like Christ now. Yes, we can, but you know what? I'm sort of held back by this physical body that I'm in. But there's going to come a day when that voice calls us up, and my physical body is going to be changed. It's going to be transformed. It's no longer going to be held by the earthly aspects that this physical body is held by. I will no longer be subject to the nature of sin that has ruled my body for these 58 years that I've been alive. I will no longer be subject to the physics that this body is held by, the biology that this body is held by. I will be like Jesus. I won't be Jesus, but I'll be like him. You know, my body will be glorified. My spirit will be free from this nature of sin when I go to be with Christ. And we'll be like him in that place. Wow, what a great hope this is. Listen, what could be greater than this in our lives? This is the hope that we have as believers. And because of this, I have this hope in me. So you know what? That actually spurs me on so that I can live a life that blesses God too. I can do good for God. You know, Christ in me can actually show every so often in, through the things I do. What a great hope we have in Jesus Christ. And then, not only for us, but for others. In Hebrews chapter 10, the writer talks to us about this and says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and toward good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I mean, listen, <laughs> If 2020 hasn't shown you, listen, folks, we're, we're, we've entered into the last of the last days. Now is not a time to not come together. Now is, and I understand because of COVID, and, and, and you, you guys were checking in on, online, you're part of our congregation. You're, you're continuing to meet together. Thank you for being part of our virtual congregation. You know, and, and you're just as much a part of our congregation as someone who comes and sits in the pew. But now is not the time to give those kind of things up. Now's not the time to begin to make ourselves busy doing the business of this world. <clears throat> you know? Um, listen, if, if I miss church, it's for a darn good reason. Why? Because I made a commitment to this church 
that I'm going to attend in worship, either in person or virtually. I'm going to be part of this. You might say, well, I don't have to, I don't have to attend this church or listen to this. I can, I can watch, you know, uh, Joel Osteen on TV, or I can watch, you know, whoever on TV, whoever you're, you know, whoever you're, you're you like in that way. And that's true, you can, but you're not really part of that congregation, you know? I mean, listen, go, go call Steve Furtick tomorrow. Give him a call. Say, hey, can I talk to Steve? You know? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I mean, call David Jeremiah. Okay, I can talk to David. I want to talk to Pastor David. See what kind of response you get. In fact, there are some churches I know, even, even uh, you know, maybe in this area, you want to talk to a senior pastor, yeah, go through a whole staff to get to him. You know? But listen, I'll, I'll tell you, we are part of a body that's close. It's, it's wonderful. And so we don't want to do it, it says here in Hebrews, we give up the assembling of ourselves together. We don't want to, and especially as we enter into these last of the last days, we want to be busy doing the work of the, of the ministry. You know, and, and working together, being part of a team. You know, we're not a lone ranger. We're part of a team. And I'm thankful for, this, for, the, for the scores, the, you know, the hundreds of people that are attached to this church that work together on team with it. And I, I appreciate being your team leader. I really do. Uh, you know, uh, we had pastor appreciation this, uh, this past month. And man, some of the things that people sent me just warm my heart. Thank you so much for doing it. It's great to be part of a team. It's great to meet together, to be connected together, to grow together. That's why I love doing the Bible reading with our church. Why? Because not well, you don't, well, I don't need to read, do the Bible reading the church, read the Bible. You know, get beyond yourself. You know, be part of something that you're with others in and grow together and, and be part of a team. It's wonderful to do that. It really is. We have an incredible team that we belong to here today. Amen. And First Thessalonians, as I'm wrapping this up here, this hope that we have is an incredible hope. You know, I, we've had a number of funerals here over the past few months even for family members of myself. And uh, we approach this time when we know the person has their faith in Christ. Man, we, we grieve, but we don't grieve like others do who don't have any hope, right? It's wonderful to be able to have our hope in eternity through Christ. Brothers and sisters, Paul says, we do not want you to be un uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet calling God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, Encourage one another with these words. Wow. Are you ready? Are you ready? Is that hope of the return of Christ, is it the blessed hope in your life? Are you prepared to receive that glory of God in you? Man, you know, I'm so thankful that we have a hope in Christ that goes beyond the past in our lives. I'm thankful for salvation. I'm thankful that my sins have been forgiven. I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful for the grace of God. I'm thankful for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'm thankful for the, for the church and all that God has provided through it. But I'm also thankful for what is not yet. I'm thankful for the days to come because I know God has a hope for my life and God has a hope for your life, that there is a hope and a future for you. And should the Lord tarry and should we still have years before he returns and should the trumpet call right even right now, there is a beautiful hope and a future that Christ has for us. A prosperity that can only be found through Him. I'm not talking about an American prosperity, a monetary prosperity, a physical prosperity. It's a prosperity that goes beyond all those things that we have through Christ. Man, that's a great hope to have. I hope you're resting in that hope today too. I hope you're spurring each other on. I hope you're encouraging one another. I hope you're trying to live a pure life before Him. I hope you're keeping your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. I hope you're looking forward to that blessed hope that we have when Jesus Christ splits the skies and we go to be with Him. Why? Just so we can escape this place? No, because listen, I'm living in victory right now. Aren't you? I mean, I think most of us are. We're living a great life that God has given us. The best life. But God has something even better than that for us in these days to come. Are you ready for that? 
Before we go this morning, I'd like to pray for you. Perhaps maybe, maybe your eyes haven't been focused on those things of love. Maybe your eyes haven't been focused on eternal things. Maybe you're sort of under the waist and the pressure of the right now, of the here and now, of the what is happening in this day. And we forget that he's God, not just in what was and what is, but what is not yet as well. And he'll be with you and for you. May I pray for you today? Jesus, I thank you that, Lord, we have a great hope in you, that we have a great future in you. And, Lord, I pray for my brothers and my sisters today that, Lord, we would be able to keep our eyes focused on you, that we would forget those things that are behind us, and we would uh, keep our eyes focused on the prize that is before us and continue to go forward towards you, that we would fix our eyes upon you because you're the author and the perfecter of our faith. Lord, I thank you for the strength that you give us, O oh God, for the power that you give us for the here and now, but also for the power that you have for us in the not yet. God, that you would pour your power out upon your people and allow us to live lives of victory in this world as well as victory in the time to come. Lord, I pray and I thank you for everyone that's watching this broadcast today. Encourage them, fill them with you, let them experience your power and your strength right where they're at. Lord, if they need healing, I pray that you would touch them right now. Holy Spirit, quicken their bodies right now. Lord, uh, uh, Jesus, I pray that you would uh, straighten out spines that are, that are crooked right now and those that have uh, slipped discs in their back. In Jesus' name, strengthen them and heal them even right now. Lord, for those... Lord, for those who are experiencing fear over COVID, Lord, I pray for perfect love to, to cast out all fear in their lives. For those who are dealing with migraines, even right now, in Jesus' name, be healed in the power of the, our Savior and in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you that you give us strength for today and hope for tomorrow. We praise you and lift you up and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Lord, bless you. Have an awesome week. I'll see you next week.